Okay, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode number 193 with my guest, Josh Tariff. Josh, I met Josh at the University of Akron uh, when he was an undergrad uh, percussion studies major um, when I was, I believe, a junior or a senior at the time. And Josh has gone on to um, get involved in the experimental theater world, the improv world. He still is an active percussionist, but also is heavily involved in the amateur professional, er, sorry, amateur wrestling uh, field out in California and uh, related to professional wrestling. I grew up in professional wrestling and it was really fun to get to talk, talk to Josh about his experience sort of dabbling in what it's like to be an announcer or, or a manager or something in professional wrestling. So um, anyway, it's good to catch up with Josh. He's doing well and it's nice to see old friends of mine kind of killing it. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Josh Tariff. Uh, I certainly did. So without further ado, Josh Tariff. Take care. Bye. You ready to go? Cool. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Josh Tariff, this is your first uh, welcome. This is your first time on the on my podcast. Is that right? That is correct, Mister Quillen. Yes. Right. Well, I was I was trying to think of what our first qu- my first question to you would be, um, and Stephanie helped me out uh, with it before we got on here. But I, um, <laughs> I just want to my ask, my old my old roommate, your wife. Well, I I sort of gave it away a little bit. So, who was the most physically attractive roommate you've ever had? Oh man, that was Adam Wells without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I said you were going to say. So, um, no, I, I, you know, your, your your wife may may have a slight edge to that, but I'm comfortable saying it because at the time she was my roommate, she was not your wife, so it's okay for me to say that then. That's true. Uh, <laughs> well, let's we can get into that, um, but uh, I'm curious, uh, maybe just so folks have a little bit more of an idea of who you are before we get too much inside baseball amongst, yeah. you know, just our our sort of shared history. But can you just like go back to baby Josh Tariff and like what? what got you like I, what if i were to just sort of like throw a few things at the wall of like here's you know somebody's like walking by is like who's josh Cherif? i'd be like these five things i know you as a percussionist i know you as yep. uh, as like an improv person theater mm-hmm. um i know you as uh the roommate of my who was you know the roommate of my wife your first year at school um and then I also know you at having a persona in the world or in the wrestling, the professional wrestling world, um, or amateur yeah. amateur professional wrestling. I don't know what your what your terminology is there, but um, it's kind of, kind of like independent pro wrestling. So pretty much like the minor leagues of pro okay. wrestling. Okay, um, is how it would be. Yeah. So uh, I, I yeah. want to get into those things, but uh, there's there's other things too. I'm sure that I'm missing here, but like I want to. So... No, nope, that's everything. That is that is my <laughs> entire life right there. Can you go back <laughs> to like baby Josh Tariff and like what where are you from? What got you sort of interested in in doing the things that 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 you were doing that that eventually led for where you and I met at the University of Akron? Yeah. Uh, so so baby Josh grew up in a small town in Massachusetts called Long Meadow. Um, and pretty much my, my earliest childhood memories pretty much were kind of what made me like the performer that I eventually became was actually through my grandfathers, uh, because my earliest childhood memories were going to one of my grandparents' homes every Saturday where my grandfather would be a trade-off. I would, he would watch a Popeye the Sailor Man VHS with me. And in exchange, I would then sit and watch wrestling with him. Um, so like my earliest memories were like from age three or four watching wrestle my grandfather while then my other grandfather on my mom's side was a singer and he always wanted to command the stage in the room and he performed a lot um he at, at someone like open for um you know like some of the big names that you would that you know of like you know from like the 40s and 50s and um Eventually, my grandmother, who was kind of one of his groupies, um, pretty much told him, like, because he had an opportunity to perform in Vegas, and she was like, you, well, you have a choice, Vegas or me, and he chose her, Um, and so really kind of my performing and my love of of wrestling, like, those two huge facts of my life both came from from them, Mm. Uh, so that's kind of what made me kind of start developing the person I am. And then when I was around, I started playing piano at a young age. And once I got to around 11 or 12, I made the switch to percussion because one of my best friends uh, was playing percussion Mm. and I didn't want to be in study hall and he got to be in band class. 
I wanted to hang out with him more. So I'm like, oh, well, I can read music. I just need a pair of drumsticks. That's fine. And then everyone, all, then the teacher was just like, no, you're actually pretty good at this. And then eventually made me like start really enjoying it and pursuing it more. And then I ended up in Akron where I got to, I got to experience the greatness that is Josh Quillen uh, for four years well, um, amongst other incredible um, uh, percussions and, and people. Well, there's um, there's yeah. <laughs> something I'm curious. So your your one your one grandfather, not the professional wrestling watching one, your other uh-huh. the one who sang. He he was a musician professionally. He, um, I mean, he for a long time, um, gigged as as a singer. Yeah, like at, at various clubs and lounges. Okay. Um, and then eventually got out of that and got into photography. Mm. Um, and then in the latter stages of his life when he was, you know, long, long retired, then was getting back into it and was like performing at like senior centers. Mm. And he, he would always tell me, he was just like, um, he would say, Josh, my boy, he would always say, Josh, my boy, you're going to say, I'm going to eventually be on the David Letterman show. Just you watch. I'm going to be on the David Letterman show. Mm -hmm. Um, He, he never got on Letterman, but he was used like his singing and his, and his uh, voice was used for like, a segment on Dateline mm. um, talking about like senior citizens, social lives. And like, it would cut to him, like singing at one of his senior clubs. And all. It was just like, that's and, awesome. and, and of course my grandma's like, that's the start. Here we go. Next stop Letterman. <laughs> my dad, my dad, my, you know, my dad was not, uh, he was a salesman. So like, I, as you're telling the story, there's a little part of, of me that's like hearing my dad, like every, anytime I played a gig, like it could have been for some thirteen, you know, or like a like a sixteen year old, you know, bat bat mitzvah, right? You know, yep. and I'm just like playing in the corner, and no one even acknowledges me. You know, I'd tell my dad, and he'd be just like, "Did you give them your Did you give them their your card? That's the first step." You know, I'm like, "Dad, like, <laughs> like everything." He's just like, "Next stop, Carnegie Hall." And I'm like, "Okay, Dad, whatever." <laughs> um, what did your other grandpa do for a living? You know, I, I really don't, I really don't know much, honestly, about my other grandpa. He, he passed away when I was five. Mm. So he died when I was very young. Um, I know he, he did like stuff in, in, in retail, uh, because that's how my dad started out. Like my dad mm. started out selling vending machines and selling shoes. See, my dad met my, my mom by selling her a pair of shoes, mm. um, but um but yeah so i mean i really don't know much as far as the 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 work life of of my other grandfather actually and i really only know more so from my mom's grandfather because he would always talk about it mm-hmm. <laughs> well were either one of them were either one of them in world war Two? yeah my mom's um yeah the singer my grandfather yeah he he, he went he went to world war Two. did you ever talk to him about any of that experience um, I, I never did. I know my uncle, his, you know, his, his son, um, you know, know, knows a lot of, a lot about that experience, um, with him. And I've heard like little bits here and there, and I've seen, um, you know, like a couple photos mm-hmm. that were taken of him back then. But, um, you know, as, as a kid, he passed away when I was 16. Mm-hmm. Um, but so as a kid, it never really dawned on me to, to you know really asking those type of questions i wish yeah. you know now as an adult i wish i did because you know like just find out all that information but all all the questions really with me were were just jokey stuff and and singing and him helping me with my diction and articulation because when i was young i had a speech impediment mm-hmm. so being that he that. was a singer he was he was very big in um in helping me like i literally sounded like elmer fudd when i was a kid i couldn't pronounce my r's Oh, okay. um, how for how and, long when did that i mean in, in your head if you were to say like this was the date it was over or this like how long did you have this in speech amendment uh probably until i was about a teenager mm. and did it uh, gradually close, go close away it. did it gradually go oh, away or was it like you yeah. woke up one day and it was you had it under control um yeah i think it was just like you know with with practice you know over time it went away i actually i grew up um yeah you probably don't know this i grew up with actually several different uh learning and physical disabilities oh. that i eventually um between the speech impediment with see occupational therapist physical therapist 
special education um, for all that. And really one of my, one of, one of my biggest like mental achievements, even though there's no like, like degree or award for it or anything like that was when I was getting ready to go to Akron, mm -hmm. I had to take a, um, like a test, kind of an assessment to see what type of special, special education assistance that I would need in college. Mm -hmm. And the test came back saying I did not need any. Mm. And that was, that was just as big a deal for me as being accepted, if not bigger, did to, you, to go to school. Did you find that when you got into Akron? I mean, it's interesting to ask, like, I mean, not that I wasn't interested in chatting with you before, but I'm now like... No, I, I know everyone else called called in sick. So I was, you know, then you came. To no, me no, 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 no. Like, but, but, <laughs> but I, but I'm, the, you know, my point in doing podcasts like this are to, is to figure out how to talk to somebody and have them tell me something they've never told anybody else before. Not, I'm sure mm. you've told other people this, but like, this is news to me and I've known you for a hot second and we were in the crucible yeah. that was University of Akron. So like, I feel like this is something that over a beer or whatever might have come up but it never did and i'm curious for you like mm -hmm. when you came to akron what was the hardest part about that particular like first couple weeks of like that that particular cold bath of water that was akron whenever you come from massachusetts where maybe sure. in your high school like myself too like where you're the hottest shit in town right like you here at in massachusetts you were the hot shit in dover ohio i was the hot shit and then i get to akron and it's like oh wow there's a lot of hot shits in here <laughs> well you know i mean it's funny you say that. So in, in terms of, of the percussion, yes, I was the hot shit, you know, in Massachusetts. And then I come to Akron and be like, I'm like the worst one here. Um, but, um, but in, but I, it was more so for me because of all the um, different things that I had growing up as far as the disabilities and things like that. And when I was young, um, my, my, my youth was not the best as far as like always a kind of being picked on and things like that. So mm -hmm. coming to Akron, it was the, um, like a couple of thoughts of, of, well, a, Hey, this is a clean slate. You know, what, you know, what, what might happen and B then it was my thought of, okay, well, are, am, am I going to be immediately judged like how I always was growing up mm -hmm. or are these people from different areas of the country. Is it different? I don't know mm -hmm. because I've just been sheltered in this one small town mm -hmm. for 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, you know, am I, am I gonna, I, you know, I get, I get to come in and, and really try to be myself, but will I be accepted as myself or will I have to try to be somebody else or mm -hmm. will they be just as rude or if not more rude than, than the kids growing up? Will they be nice? Will, um, you know, and, and, and then came the barrage of nicknames, uh, that I received, but, but they were, they were all in good fun. So it's just like, oh, I don't mind these names, even though they're kind of jokey. It's like, it's, it's a, well, it's what a were some, what were some of them? I think we, me oh. and Ron Martin gave you turkey leg because um, you... yeah, Ron, Ron Martin gave me turkey leg. Mm -hmm. Um, um, there was of course tea bag. Um, there were which, some off color ones. Yeah. I mean, there were some off color ones. It was pretty um, equal opportunity though. Like I got some too. Absolutely. Like, like oh yeah. Was... That, that, yeah. Um, the, uh, diesel. I don't remember. That um, one. you remember, you I don't, don't remember. I don't remember. I remember tea bag very little. I remember turkey leg was the thing. That, uh, that was... uh, turkey leg was the big one. A uh, milk drinker okay. was, was one right. too. Um, and then being in the middle of Ohio and I'm Jewish, there aren't many Jews out mm -hmm, there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so there were there was some you know some jewish type nicknames that i had as well i don't um, i personally but, i'm gonna i'm gonna plead the fifth here i don't remember anything about the, no, that's the, fine. those particular names so like pardon if i ever had anything to do with any of those particular ones please know no from and, a place and, of ignorance and, 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 and youth naivete no, and, and the, <laughs> the thing was i wasn't offended at all like with them because like anyone who 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 did who who did something like that like they, they would come up to me like prior to just like like i'm not, i hope i'm not trying i hope i'm not offending you you know it's just like joke and and like i'd have people say like because honestly i've never met a jewish person like it was like to that point yeah out there and it's just like i'm like i'm not like acting differently than you i'm not an orthodox jew or anything like that by any means you know 
I, I always joke I'm a reformed Jew, which is the Diet Coke of Jew. I pretty much just, you know, pick and choose what I what I do. I think, you know, um, I would say the same, like, I was raised Catholic, but now I'm Lutheran. And I would even say, like, you know, there's, everything is a spectrum. Like, you have... Yeah everybody's on some you slide everybody's around on a sliding scale somewhere but the, one of the things that you bring up about akron which i which I, I don't think is completely unique to the university of akron but it's something that is getting talked about more and more in society and and it's like um like bullying and giving people shit mm -hmm. and those sorts of things and i i feel like one of the things that from where i'm from in ohio in like a very small town um, it, honor culture is the wrong phrase, but it, there's a lot of just like, you have to be able to put up with some shit. Like the reason somebody gives you shit is because they're testing you because they, they don't know if they're going to be able to rely on you when the shit hits the fan. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's the, I mean, there's a lot of people in the military talk about that. Why there's like so much hazing and all that stuff. Like, yes, it goes way too far. Absolutely. fucking -lutely. Can you absolutely mm -hmm. abuse that? But I have found myself at 41, like with my bandmates and so percussion, I haze Adam Slowinski verbally more than anybody else in my life. I give him so much shit. But it, as it turns out, the older I get, it's be, like I'm. Cl it's clear to me that it's because I care about Adam. At, you know, yeah. not not more than anybody else, but it's like that's a way I show affection is to sort of like give give people shit and rib them a little bit and take the piss out of them as they say in england and i'm curious for you like being on the receiving end of that i was too i mean murray mast and matt mm -hmm. dudak oh my god they wrote me <laughs> oh, like oh oh dude dude dudak i mean still to this day well well <laughs> well i mean they, they <laughs> rode me like a pony to the point where i got yeah. in murray's face one day and i was like shut the fuck up bro like i don't like i don't know why you're doing this. why are you calling me this you know and so for you, like, I'm curious coming into an environment like that fresh, like, how did you perceive all that? And what was your, how do you think about that stuff now? I, well, now looking back at it, I think it was, it was kind of like my test, my initiation, you know, like, especially that first, like that first semester. And, and I know like, cause as I progressed at school, the freshman that came in like that first semester I was giving it right back to them the way that I got it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but it was the type of thing of, okay, well, you know, they might tell you that you suck at this because it's a whole new world. Uh, they might make fun of you for your name or by you're wearing something or, or whatever it is. But if you're, if you, you know, kind of going along with it, that's their way of testing to see whether or not they can respect you and rely on you, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, like, for example, the very first semester, I hated steel drums. Mm. I didn't, like, I feel like I asked Matt Dudak, like, within, like, the first week or so, like, do I have to take this class? Which is obviously the absolute worst thing that you should ask the steel band director <laughs> at the university. Yeah. Um, but because it was just like, no, I'm like, I'm like, no, I mean, yeah, I know the notes, but there's a whole different technique than piano. I don't want to learn a whole new thing. That's why I never did marching band. Mm. As much as Galen Character wanted me to do marching band, like, I didn't want to learn new technique. Mm. I'm sure it would have been fine. I would have, you know, enhanced my knowledge of stuff, but I was just being stubborn and just like, mm. no, nah, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but then when, you know, so Dudak and uh, Jeff Knightsky and Bill Salick and, uh, you know, they, they, they throw some, fun jokes at me for almost wanting ex you know, better treatment for not wanting to be in steel band and then kind of, you know, egging me on when I'm in steel band rehearsal and messing up. But then by spring semester, I was just absolutely in love with it. And so it was in their way, you know, kind of testing me to see, hey, we're going to kind of nudge you a little bit. Are you going to, you know, are you going to go with it the wrong way? Or are you going to embrace the challenge and and better yourself and i feel like by me bettering myself even though i always you know will get the nicknames and people you know still crack jokes at me but it, but it's out of out of the love out of the fact that you know we we have the the, the cowbell clan for a reason mm -hmm. uh you know because mm -hmm. we're, we're all you know um, a unique a unique family that at any time can get together and drink together make fun of each other and then play some damn good percussion together 
<laughs> it's a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I I just as I we as you know, I'm I just turned for I'm going to be turning 42 this July, and you know, in the new mm-hmm. music world, in so percussion, we're constantly talking about community, and I'm sure I'm sure in the professional wrestling world, there's similar conversations. Like, I follow enough people in those worlds on social media to be like yeah there's a community here too that is either healthy or not and is either being fostered and cared for by the people within it or has a bad apple in it and is ruining the whole vibe you know and so when i think back to the communities i had that were the most healthy it's oftentimes university of akron is for me Mm -hmm. is there um and it's being in a steel band in a pan yard like and in Mm -hmm. particular one in brooklyn or in trinidad like is oddly the, the place where I feel the safest. But let me clarify here. Those are also two of the most complicated places I've been in my life where there's been moments where something has happened and everybody in the room is like, that wasn't cool. <laughs> and then everybody in the room, because we're all in the same boat floating on the same ocean by ourselves. Like we all, yeah, everybody has to be like, well, put your finger in that dam because it's, or that in the side there, because we're all going to drown if you don't knock that shit off. You know, like, mm-hmm. yeah, those sorts of things happen. They just happen in weirdly nuanced ways and to sort of like burn down and, and roast a whole studio because of one thing that happened. Like, I feel like you could find any moment of my five years at Akron and be like, well, that would absolutely mean that Josh could never get hired at a school ever because he was in the room when they did this thing or whatever, you know. But, um, you know, we used to bring, we used to, Adam, Adam Wells used to bring red wine to rehearsals in McDonald's cups, you know? Oh yeah. And, oh, the people would, would drink during rehearsals. There'd be times where we would, we should be rehearsing, but instead we went into the, um, the band rehearsal room and played wiffle ball. Oh yeah. There was uh, a lot, a lot of my life was, was wiffle ball with Bill Salick, by the way, I want to rope in a few people here who are successful yeah, and ha- pretend yes. to have a career that people should look at like Bill Salick, Jason Little. I also played yes. an inordinate amount of wiffle ball with Jason Little in the, in the basement of, of Gazetta Hall. My, some of my greatest athletic achievements in my life came came from those wiffle ball games. Uh. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you, um, of Josh, just because we could we could go deep on the 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 Akron time, uh, and just be clear, I don't I'm not I don't want to like advocate for bullying or hazing, but I think um, a healthy nickname here and there can absolutely can go a long way um but let me ask you you're the professional wrestling i too grew yes. up on it with uh except mm-hmm. i no one in my family watched it except for me and my brother i was mm-hmm. a ricky the dragon steamboat guy mm-hmm. um watched all of those legendary rick flair ricky the dragon steamboat matches um my my dad was like this is fake i don't understand why you watch this and this is like this is going to be the rot of society is this fake it's not real it's not reality yeah. that's what he kept saying to me my mom and my older sister would always tell me the same thing now donald trump was just our president for four years don't Who, remind me now I'm, yes. I'm trying not to blame, i'm trying not to blame <laughs> professional wrestling but i feel like professional wrestling unfortunately is sort of like the patient zero for publicized charlatanism backed by an incredible amount of athletic ability enough so that you can actually convince young people that what's happening is real right Mm -hmm. fast forward 20 years we have the real world we have all of these other things that can convince people that what they're watching is real and -hmm. then you have donald trump as the end result why is professional wrestling still so awesome even though, <laughs> even though I'm personally right now, and Sean, you know, I have a good, good a former student of mine, Sean Perham, who would absolutely punch me in the face for even implying that wrestling had something to do with Donald Trump. But what, why, why am I wrong, or why am I right, and why is professional wrestling such a powerful thing, not just in the world, but specifically in the United States? It's got, it really has some strong roots here. That, I mean, Canada too. I mean, Bret the Hitman Hart. There's a lot of like Canadian mm-hmm. um, artists too, but. Talk to and, me. and it's actually as big as it is in America. It's even bigger in uh, like the UK and Japan. Right. Right. Um, but, but for me, professional wrestling arguably is like the last great performance art. And, and what I mean by that is you're, you're watching people 
live, like in person, no stunt doubles, no no cuts, no no retakes. Yes, it's predetermined, but it's um, it's a program where you're looking at a combination of athleticism, action, suspense, acting, comedy at times, um, where it's all unfolding before your very eyes with just two people in a square, no props, no nothing. I mean, with the exception of like, you know, the occasional steel chair or something like that. But, um, but like the best comparison of watching a, like a wrestling show on TV is the Muppet show. If you go back to the Muppet show, like they come on and saying, Hey, we have this plan. Like this is our guest, this is a show, this, this, but then you have all the chaos backstage and all of a sudden things happen and things go wrong. Like, Oh, well now you go out there and do something. And it's like, well, that's what wrestling's doing, just not with puppets. Mm. Like, these are real people doing things, and people really get hurt. I've gotten hurt, you know, and I've never been, like, a physical re- – I've been referee, manager, commentator. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've gotten hurt by it because it – and I know plenty of people who gotten, you know, some major injuries from it because it takes a toll on a body. Yeah, if here's the face and they're punching – maybe like they might slightly miss the punch or just like hit them very lightly mm-hmm. open fist, but add the theatrics with it. But when you're hitting them with a the chair, they're really going to hit with a chair when they're getting slammed on the mat, they're really falling down. I mean, it's the, the fact that these people will um, do this to their body with no off season. They go all year mm, round. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it, that and, it wasn't a cyclical and, thing. Yeah. It's, it's all year. There's never reruns. And, and along with that, and this is what really made me grow to it when I was young and being bullied when I was like growing up mm. in Massachusetts was the fact that I turn on wrestling, tall guys, short guys, fat guys, skinny guys, mm. fast guys, slow guys, all different walks of life, but somehow they all have a role in our working together and they're, they, they found a home. They're like, you can call it the Island of the Misfit Toys. But, you know, it's like they all feel like they belong and they all have a role. And that's why when I was really young, it's like, I want to do that because I'm going to feel included. Because even though I'm different here, I would have a spot there. Can I ask? I mean, it's interesting that you say that. And I'm, I'm just going to be like, I'm going to be the far, the, the far left Please. Like, advocate being like, but this is offensive. Like, you say that, yet... <laughs> professional wrestling like pretty much plays on every i guess they do it seems like they do it pretty much across the board every major stereotype about every race or culture or religion of people seems to be like let's just grab the magnifying glass and put it right on that and then make a costume about it and that goes back to especially back in like the the 70s and 80s absolutely i mean a, a good friend of mine mike kent um does a podcast and he had on a professional wrestler who played somebody with down syndrome and i cannot remember the character's name eugene eugene yes Yes, yep, Nick had, Dinsmore. Yes, he had Nick. Yes, Nick Dinsmore. He had him on his podcast and was talking about it and, and asked him, like, do you think you could ever do that character again? And it was like, I I mean, you could try, but I'll bet. I mean, so I'm I'm just curious, like I'm playing devil's advocate here a little bit. Yeah. Like, what how is that stuff talked about within the community? Because you just said that you never felt more like a desire to be in a in a pool of people because you felt like you would be included. What was it? And you and you have childhood trauma from speech impediments mm-hmm. and, and and things, learning disabilities. What? How do you explain that dissonance? Why doesn't that work sure. for somebody who doesn't understand what's happening? Well, it's well, it's it's one of those things where it's it's tough to say because I mean, then you go like you know, say you fast forward a little bit, say you go to like the late nineties, early two thousands, mm-hmm. where Jerry Springer was the norm like that type of raunchiness mm-hmm. and sex appeal and you know like wrestling and the play on like kind of catered like, catered to that right. now you fast forward to today you know they don't let they typically don't let men and women like physically wrestle each other they've gotten rid mm-hmm. of like you know doing the, the the sexy things the uh the quote-unquote sexy things um so so they're they try to adapt to, 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 you know, the society of today, 
But when you're looking at someone, especially now with all social media and all the catalogs and history and stuff we can go back to, let's take this guy who has never really followed wrestling, but is now writing a story on it. Mm-hmm. All right, so I got to study and look at the history of it. Well, now I'm going to go to the history in 2021. Oh, my God. In, in 2002, they had they had a guy with mental disabilities as a wrestler pretend to be like, that's just so appalling. And it's just like, because at the time, mm-hmm. it was accepted. Mm-hmm. And people actually cheered for it. That char- Eugene character for like a six-month span was one of the most popular good guys in wrestling. Well, let me ask you, I mean, how much, I mean, this is the thing too that I'm, I'm curious, that, that bums me out when yeah. people get upset about a quote or something from, you know, years ago. Um, it, uh, I think we need to be, as a society, be able to look at somebody like a character like Eugene and be like, okay, we won't do that today. Right, and we won't I can, do that, and, and can, that was a character. And I can say that without, like, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that character today, and I don't have to get upset about that. Also, mm-hmm. I can say, like, I can understand at the time, you know, what else is, what else, if I have to cancel Eugene or get upset about that, then I also have to look at Happy Gilmore. I have to look at... Right. There's something about Mary. I have to look about every movie. If, I have to look you at... Go what, back to the, if you go back to the first few seasons of The Office... There is no way that show would be on TV. And I'm sorry. The, I get in an argument with my guys and, and my bandmates and so because they love the show Friends. And I'm like, that show had fat suits and like gay chicken and all of the things in it that, right. that are now like, if I did that, if I tweeted out some quote from Ross Geller, I would be like canceled right now. But anyway, just to say like, it's important to understand the context because there was, I mean, Adam Sandler was making movies where he was playing like the, what's the... The the water Billy boy, Madison the Billy Madison the water boy, oh the water boy yeah I mean like so the idea I'm curious do do you feel like professional wrestling um, and I feel like you call them you called it performance art I yeah. as an artist who thinks about the music side of art more than any other sort of facet of art I feel like sometimes mm-hmm. my job is to comment on what I see in society at that time. How much of that is happening? Like, are there conversations in the professional wrestling world, like where somebody like Eugene or somebody, you know, what what's happening in those conversations? Or are these characters just completely out of the blue? Or somebody is John Cena super inspired by something that he saw in the news, and that's boom, that's why my character is going the way it does. Or does a character like turn heel um, because of something that because of a terrorist attack? Like, what? How are those conversations happening? In the yeah, I mean it. They're, they're all different things with that. Now, obviously, in the case of, like, WWE, the biggest one of them all is, you know, they got all their writers and producers, and they're getting calls from the network about, we want more of this, we want less of this. Uh, so they make mm-hmm. the adjustments with that. But going back as far as, you know, when you mentioned terrorists, because it was dawning on me when we were talking about Eugene. So back, so this was sometime while I was in college with you, so, like, maybe 2003-ish, mm-hmm. um, there was a wrestler on on tv his name was muhammad hassan okay and he was he was pretty much like like he was an american muslim who was pretty much like his character was you guys aren't treating me fairly Mm. because of because of how i look and he was bringing you know like um and that was his character and he became one of the top bad guys Mm. now there was a segment that he was doing or uh, a feud that he was doing with the undertaker, which everyone knows who the undertaker is um, where there was, there was a, a point where he had a bunch of guys after at the end of one show who were all wearing masks, attack the undertaker and, and carry off his, his sidekick guy. Like he was a martyr sacrificed himself to the undertaker. And it was a very terrorist like display. Mm. Two days or so prior to when that aired, there was a terrorist attack in London. Mm -hmm. And they aired this because one of the main matches at the pay-per-view coming up was Undertaker versus Muhammad Assad. Well, the amount of people that were up in the arms of WWE portraying this, it all came back at them. And it's just like the pay-per-view matches in two weeks, Hassan will not be on TV until then. 
when the match happens, Undertaker's going to destroy him. And then we never saw Muhammad Hassan again. And then he was, he was pretty much let go. Wow. Like, because they, they realized they screwed up. People commented on it. And this was, you know, prior to social media. Just imagine if Twitter and everything was around today when this happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they took it as like, hey, what we did is wrong. We got to fix it. So they do listen to these things and they, and they still do um, today with people like there was just last week, there was a wrestler who in real life is a diabetic and they have like very limited crowd in one of their shows Mm -hmm. where this wrestler got beat up badly, where then they had referees like come out and like pretending MTs to, to, you know, tend to him because he got beat up. Mm -hmm. And the wrestler was kind of like shaking a little bit where to the fans eyes, is he having a seizure? Is he having a diabetic seizure right now? And all of a sudden social media started blowing up saying like, mm. uh, we, um, what, uh, you know, thought, thoughts to Kyle O'Reilly is the wrestler's name. Thought, thoughts to Kyle O'Reilly because it looks like he, it looks like as the show ended, he started going, having a seizure and going to shock and everyone started going up in arms and freaking out. I was like, why would WWE do that? Why would they put someone with diabetes like in that type of position? And he wasn't like he, like WWE and the wrestler himself had to like go on social media and be like, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. This was like, this, like, this was a, well, like well, a story people- thing. It wasn't supposed to look like that. Yeah. Uh, so people will always get the ideas and, in some cases, they're right, but in some, they're they're just like, okay, we're gonna pump the brakes a little bit because you have to remember, this is a story. Just like if you go watch any superhero movie, where you get upset when someone dies or someone does something and complain about it, it's like, well, hey, that's scripted. So is this. I feel this like, is just live in person. I mean, but they're still. Let, oh, let me ask you this. So, like, you do, but yeah. the difference is, you go to a movie. And there's a thing that says up front, the names and places have been changed to protect the identity of the actor, or this is PG-13. Mm-hmm. It tells you all these things. And you, you, or it says that this movie is based on a true story, right? Mm-hmm. If the if every WWF event started with the actions depicted here are not based on any real stories or real people, like, if like, like you get at the beginning of Unsolved Mysteries or sure, something, sure. you know? I feel like people might take it might might not then take to Twitter when they see somebody like there's still it's interesting to me that there's still this like perception that that everything you're seeing is planned out like it goes back to the is it the Brett the Hitman Hart the um the Montreal screw job where he yep. where that was the first time in professional wrestling where what happened what was supposed to be predetermined didn't actually happen and Brett the Hitman Hart Gets... That that we know of. That we know. That we, of. that we know because it was uh, such, but, um, such broadcasted to such an extent. Yeah. Right. But Bret the Hitman Hart. The key to wrestling is that everybody in the ring knows what's supposed to happen. Right. That's yeah. that's the yeah. Because you're all supposed to work together to put on a great match. A great that's show. the fundamental premise: is that both p- yeah. players know what's happening. Right. Well, Bret the Hitman Hart was not aware that he was going to get tapped out or something at a certain point, or the ref was going to do something, and he lost the belt. And what people were witnessing was him going bonkers, not because he lost, but because he wasn't supposed to lose. And yep. you're seeing this like dichot, like he's the only person in the room that knows that this is fake and is, and is having a meltdown live. Right. But now our psychology around professional wrestling is that like, we now assume everything is fake. So when we see something happening, you can't you you still can't tell like we're now past the point yeah. you know and you see somebody shaking you're like well Brett the hitman heart this must be all planned out right because they surely would have fixed that like this isn't going to happen again right this is a theater production you don't watch a mm-hmm. movie with quentin tarantino and expect the guy in this like what if the guy on the couch getting read the 23rd psalm or whatever like actually got shot and died that can't yeah. happen, <laughs> you know. Like anyway, it's like anyway. I I just am fascinated by professional wrestling because it still has that psychological sort of claw that it can get in your brain. Yeah. Oh, it, it absolutely does. And and again, with the fact that you know you're you don't have the director per se. They're not yelling cut and adjusting and having stunt doubles and things like that. 
That's why there are still so many people that be like, oh yeah, I can watch a Tarantino film because I I know it's scripted. I, I I know it's fake, but it's just like, like how do you watch this stuff? Which is like, it's just a different format of that Tarantino film. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just it's like there aren't the stunt doubles, and it's all just one take. Do they <laughs> do they? How far out in advance? This is just sort of some like because I also I know that like to put on a production on the scale of the WWE at like an mm-hmm. arena. Like I know what level of work it takes to put on a soap percussion show at Carnegie Hall. Yep. It's a lot of stage plots, a lot of backline. You can't just walk in the room and be like, "You know what? I need a surge protector over here now." And they'd be like, "Well, hold up a second. You didn't ask for that. We got to get the union." Like there's a whole lot of things that aren't that you I'm sorry, wrestling events have to be planned out. And I'm curious how far out in advance does the storyline or at least enough of a structure of a storyline for a production like WWE, like how far in advance do they know what's going to happen? Or is it literally they're making it up days before? Uh, it, it varies on, on how now, like they'll have certain ideas for stories that they'll plan for, for months, mm-hmm. but as things progress, things are going to get adjusted in that. Maybe, Maybe someone got hurt and they had right, to adjust right. something. Maybe a crowd isn't reacting the way they wanted and they'll adjust something. So they'll have certain ideas that could go for months on end, but there are some like episodes of Monday Night Raw or SmackDown that they are rewriting the show like two hours prior to going on the air. Mm. Um, and be like, oh, hey, such such wrestler, you know how you were supposed to cut this five minute promo and then have this 12 minute match with this guy? Well, things change. You now have a two-minute promo and a six-minute match with that guy. It's just like, oh, well, now I got to readjust my timing and what I want to say and what well, I'm going to do with this person and all that. How much of the fighter or the, the fighter, the wrestler, um, like the when when Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair would come out and be just like, I'm profiling, hostile, and alligator <laughs> boot wearing, Cadillac driving, like all that stuff. Like, yes, they've got that <laughs> stuff. That like he's got his lines that he's practiced on his note cards, but like, how uh-huh. much of that stuff was was improvised versus, play- like, who's the, the 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 genius or whoever that guy that would just come out and rhyme everything, and it'd be like four minutes of him rhyming everything, and you're like, that's you got to be kind of good to do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of like the, um, you know, like the old school guys like the Hogan and the Flair and all of that. So there was a, a there was a a long you know period of time where. They're just pretty much told, all right, we're giving you two minutes. Um, you're you gotta mention, you know, that you're wrestling this guy on this date and this match. Mm-hmm. Make sure those are in and go. And a lot of those guys then would be the the creative ones, or maybe they're kind of sitting, knocking ideas back and forth with various people and be like, like, man, like, you know, you're you're like Flair, you're like you're living that high life. You're you're riding up here in the limousines, you're 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 styling, and it's just like yeah, and pro, uh, stand, and limits around and style, and, pro, blah, 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 and then they come with it. Nowadays, with you know the mass production that it is, ninety five percent of the wrestlers that you see on TV today, they are memorizing scripts like they're soap opera actors. Mm. People are just writing it completely out for them, word for word. Mm. And depending on where you are in the card, if you don't say it word for word, then you're going to get in trouble. Like only a few people that they're just so confident in, in, in what we've seen you guys, as far as, because at times, you know, you might have to improvise on things mm-hmm. uh, because again, crowd reaction, technical difficulties, whatever mm-hmm. might happen because it's live. Uh, but it, like a guy like a, his name is Paul Heyman. He's a manager. Mm-hmm. Like that type of guy is just like, all right, you know, you know how to talk. So just make sure you mention this, this, and this, you got three and a half minutes. And then he'll he'll pretty much kind of do his thing, but everyone else, you know, especially like say, hey, two hours prior, the show just changed. Now you got to memorize this script, and they got two hours to memorize their promo and what they need to do. What would you say would be like if you had, like you said that you're not a wrestler character, right? Like, like you're a referee, a manager, and like what if you had the pick of your job in the wrestling community and it paid all the money mm. in the world and there were no logistical hurdles. And it was like, you were just going to do that now. Like, what would it be? It would be a manager. Why? I would be a manager. Um, 
You're talking about like like is it Jimmy 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 the, the like like a Jimmy Hart, Bobby the Brain, yeah, Heaton, yeah. Paul Heyman, like those type of guys. Big glittery tennis racket. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the reason for that is those people are still characters. They're still heavy involved in the actual match themselves. Um, they're the ones being listened to that live crowd because like commentators, I absolutely love it to death and would always be happy to do it they're being listened to by the people at home right so the reactions that you're getting in that crowd the commentators have nothing to do with those in crowd reactions those are being done by most of the wrestlers but then anyone else who was speaking he's like the, the manager the primary is part of that yeah and it's like you know I, as you're as you were talking i remember like the couple times i've gone to see like conan o'brien filmed or like any of those live shows, there is somebody for who, who, for, for whom their job is to run around and be like, clap now. Like, let's get riled up. Like he's they're like, oh, yeah. they're like the hype man or hype woman or hype person. Yeah, and like, they're the, like one, yeah. And a manager is kind of like that for their wrestler. And they're typically paired with wrestlers who they feel have a lot of talent, have a good presence and can be very successful with merchandise and marketability, mm -hmm. but aren't good at speaking. The undertaker, they, for they, example, they, Paul bearer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right, and and but then over time, Paul Bearer left the Undertaker because he developed and became good enough to speak. Um, so now there are some there are some exceptions to that. There's going to be like like a Brock Lesnar, for example. Mm -hmm. He can speak if he chose to, but he's such an intimidating presence. Mm -hmm. It's better that he doesn't. So then, on the rare occasion that he does grab the mic, everyone's just like, "Oh, he, he's mad. He's plus, about to talk." Plus, everybody in the world knows he does the UFC as well. And he can, yeah. he like does actually legitimately smash and knock people unconscious like for a living. Yeah. And so there is a little bit like, he doesn't need a hype man because he's got, you can go see him kill people if you want. Yeah. So, I mean, just, you know, the, the thought of, of pretty much having an arena full of people in the palm of my hand, listening mm -hmm. to whatever I have to say, whether it's cheering or booing. I love, I love it more when they boo. Mm -hmm. Um, I love, I love being a heel. I love being a villain so much. Um, and it's just like, you know, they, cause they're, they're angry when you succeed, but then if you fail, they're just like, ha, ah, ah, you suck. I knew you lose. Uh, you get an just, equal like, reaction regardless of whether you succeed or fail. Absolutely. Like, um, uh, you know, an independent, uh, over an independent wrestling, the most common character that I, that I go by is the name uh the name was given to me of christian rosenberg mm -hmm. um because many years ago i reminded a, a guy running the show of chris rose the baseball analyst okay i i'm not know that and for some reason he's just like you remind me of chris rose so i need to name you something like that christian rosenberg i'm like i'm like oh, well first off i'm jewish so that name is just weird um but it but 15 years later it's it stuck and and there are times where you know um, and maybe I'm being a, a heel manager at, at a place and people are booing or, and like chanting, you know, like Christians, <laughs> like Christian sucks or, you know, like things like that, but you know, it's just towards me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I remember one specific time where I was, I was a heel at a show and now after the show, you know, like you're still kind of in character if you're around fans, but you know, if kids are coming up to you asking for an autograph, you know, I'm not going to like yell at the kid and like buzz off, but I'll, I'll be like, you know, like I had a kid one time come up to me, ask me for my autograph and be like, all right, well, say my name properly because there they were going like to annoy Christian Rosenberg. They were going Rosie, Rosie, like, I'm like, mm -hmm. that's not my name. So I look at him like, I'm like, all right, well, what's my name? Like your name's Christian Rosenberg. Okay. Now I'll sign this for you. And then, and then he went like, thanks, Rosie, and runs. Mm -hmm. uh, but meanwhile, like, his dad was that was there, and then his dad wa walked up to me and was just like, I got to tell you, you watching you, you reminded me of, like, a young Bobby the Brain Heenan. And I had to stay in my character, of course, and be like, be like he wishes he was me type deal. But in my mind, I was like, that's, like, the greatest compliment you could have possibly given me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it's interesting. I mean, too, the kid, like the thing I'd like, uh, uh, I, this is a nerdy reference, but like, like in Greek tragedies, there's a tacit agreement between 
people in the audience and like politicians and stage actors that there's like one person's job for whom it is to come out and mock everybody and like there's an mm -hmm. agreement that like when you enter into this arena that we as a like society breaks down and all the rules are gone like we're now in a new special place that doesn't have government presidents and kings don't matter in here i can make fun of the way your teeth look mr president you know like that's right. what happens in greek tragedies right and in the professional wrestling world like there is this tacit agreement that as long as you do your job and you stay in character that little kid can can have that back and forth with you and then do then break all the rules you set up for him yeah and and run away and know that there's no real consequences like this is this new right. ecosystem that that's been set up and i think it's yeah, important. like i was like oh, yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not about to to, to to hit a fan or anything like that if they don't do what i say yeah <laughs> right and the idea that like you might see like the undertaker you know seeing him there was a there was a video of him at a ufc event watching brock lesnar fight and you see yeah. these two guys and you're like and they have this kind of intense exchange, but you sort of also see a little bit of like they're playing the game still. Like there's this tacit mm -hmm. agreement where I can break the rules here. This is a UFC event, but now it's a WWF event, you know, and like or a yeah, WWE. Yeah. And I, I really just feel like as an artist, wrestling for all of the times, I'm gonna be honest, that I will that I make fun of it sometimes. I'll, I'm just gonna cop to it. I make fun of wrestling too, and I'm a part of it. I mean, but, there are things in it that be like, all right, this is kind of dumb. <laughs> but culturally it has a stigma you know it's like it has yeah. this like you know white trash you know redneck you know all of that stupid stuff but i feel but to me the more i learn about it the way you talk about it is not much different than the way you know people talk about the like comedians and this we need spaces in society where once you're inside of it everyone is fair game and mm -hmm. anyone can be anybody i think you highlighting that point up front about your own personal which you i didn't know anything about like for you, that place was a space where you could, for the first time, feel like you could be anybody and no one was going to judge you. You got to choose whether or not you were a heel. You didn't have to have someone else choose that for you. Exactly, yeah. And that's a big thing. Well, Josh, this has been... We hardly talked about drums. We mostly. I was going to say we're done already. We I, like, haven't even talked about college. We haven't talked much about Akron at all. It's okay. I we have my door is always <laughs> open. I find that about at, at around like fifty minutes, and I've already stolen fifty two minutes of your life from you. Um, that's when that's when I feel like people you leave them wanting more. But I, I listen. I have learned. I've checked my boxes. I've learned many things about you that I didn't know ahead of time. Um, and I appreciate you sharing with me the, the little thing about your speech impediment. And, you know, I know that that's, some, I don't know how public you are with that stuff, but I know it, it sometimes it's not easy. I, 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 you know, when I, when I was young, um, I, I wasn't public with, with anything. I mean, but probably by the time I graduated from Akron, mm -hmm. there was probably like maybe two or three non-family members that actually knew, uh, knew the different things that I had growing up. Now I'm at a point where I'm just comfortable sharing it with anyone who wants to listen. What were the uh, because what? I yeah I hope like I can help like inspire and motivate people who have dealt with similar less or, or worse things. Well, before we, we wrap up, what were the other things you said? Speech impediment. What was what were some other things you were you had to deal with? So I had um, um, physical disabilities that I mean, you will find this ironic being I'm a percussionist that impacted my hand eye coordination. Mm. Um, like I was an occupational therapist trying to learn how to tie shoes and button shirts huh. uh, because I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And with that, it also impacted my balance. So I actually, when I was very young, like, like infant toddler, doctors actually told my parents, they weren't sure whether or not I'd be able to walk. Really? Um, so like, you know, I, you know, I was just working, overcoming all those. And then all of a sudden I get scholarship and get my bachelor's and master's in percussion, which is nothing but hand-eye coordination. <laughs> um, that's true. Um, then, um, like learning disability, I also had this thing kind of like the nickname for it was processing. Okay. So like at the time when I was young, cause obviously there wasn't as much technology back then. So it was like less than like 10% of, of kids were kind of diagnosed with it at that time, where it was kind of like the thing of if I, for some reason, didn't agree with something or if I was kind of confused by something, my brain would just pretty much shut down and anything else that's being talked about in class never came to mind. Or it'd be to a point where I'm so literal of like, okay, you said it, you said three plus two equals five. Mm -hmm. 
cool. I learned three plus two equals five. All of a sudden, if the test says two plus three, I'm, gonna, I'm like, we didn't learn this in class. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because it was just such a thing. And that's the type of thing where, like I said, when I mm. took that test headed into Akron, that I didn't need the special ed- education help. Uh, so, I mean, th- those are like the main things that really, um, you know, hindered me when I was young and, and you know, resulted in, in the kids being kids and bullying and stuff. But then I, thankfully I got to go to Akron, had the best four years of my life still to this day because I was accepted for, for who I was and got made fun of, but in a respectful family type way. <laughs> Um, because then I was able to throw it right back at people. Yeah. What, well, let me ask you, what do you start? Do you struggle with anything still to this day? That is, I mean, as far as, dis- as far as disabilities, um, no, not really. Um, I mean, you know, like depending on the type of, of physical exercise or something that I have to do, if it's something that's kind of tougher for, for balancing, I might have hmm. some difficulty with it. Um, like, Here's a good example. Like I try to work, work out as much as I can. I know I need to do more cardio stuff. I cannot jump rope to save my life because trying to figure out the coordination of mm-hmm, moving my mm-hmm, hands, mm-hmm. following the rope and jumping over it. Like I just can't do it. Now, if I like seriously buckle down and really work on it, I'm sure eventually I could, but yeah, there are certain things that, you know, I'm, are, are things that I'm not that good at, but I can get by without them. You don't ever find anything like, you know, you wake up one day and you you talking to yourself and your old speech impediment comes back and you're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like, like it doesn't no, come back. No, nothing, I don't. Not, no, no, I don't have any issues where all of a sudden like I wake up in the morning and and like the physical issues that I had when I was young come back. Mm. I'll wake up in the morning and and will have bad memories of how I was treated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, like just you know like the mental anguish type stuff but but as far as like you know the disability things that i had uh no i mean i'm proud to say i've pretty much overcome as far as i know like overcome all of them to the best of my ability to the point where i can i can live a good life and enjoy the things that i do enjoy the friends and be able to to sit here with the legendary josh quillen talk about the good times when we were young and didn't have responsibilities yep, and now and, and now and now we're we're old ass men who are like sore every morning um in our backs and our hips and our knees <laughs> and and both of us are grown beards you're much more successful than me at that <laughs> well i ref i referenced adam wells i should i should real i should real quick just clarify a few things for folks who maybe don't understand you were let's talk about adam wells for a you minute. moved yes. in my my wife <laughs> My, well, at the time, my girlfriend, Stephanie Kirshner, was a student at the University of Akron. Um, she and I have since gone on to get married. We've been together for 20 years now. But that's you... So, that, that's so bizarre. Honestly, I think the last time that I saw you two in person was your wedding. That might be that might be right. Well, you guys in college, Stephanie was looking for some roommates. And she was always like, I'd feel more comfortable if they were guys, actually. And, and you guys moved in. Adam Wells, I knew Adam from the year prior, and I didn't know who you were. And I just remember walking into that apartment and seeing what? Well, no, I'm going to correct you because you did. Because we moved in together my junior year. Oh, was it that far? Okay, well, then I knew. Yeah, because my first two years, I lived in the dorms. Okay, well, I knew... Okay, you knew Adam because you like lived with him. You you knew him better. I knew him better, but I knew of you, I guess, though. So that's a good clarification. When I found out the two of you were going to be living with, with Stephanie, I was like, Oh yeah, there's no competition here. I'm not looking like well, there's no. Je- <laughs> I don't. I you know I can be a you, jeal- jealous person. I understand you, it. You know, but you 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 didn't think that somehow like with me like cooking my my frozen dinners and and just watching Monday Night Raw, you didn't think all I, of a sudden she'd look at it and be like, you know what? That's the guy. I remember Domino, <laughs> Domino's Pizza, huge roast beef only Subway subs, <laughs> and um something else i i I, there's other things and then adam wells like i'm sure i'm anyway it was a very very interesting uh relationship but i should say that i'll tell you you, from from my confidence and self-esteem i feel i feel very very glad knowing that you back then was just like tara i got nothing to worry about she's not gonna (laughs) she's, she's not gonna hook up she's not gonna hook up with turkey leg 
for sure. <laughs> well, so Turkey Leg, just so folks know the nickname Turkey Leg, you Ron Martin and I lived. You together. never thought you never thought that she wanted to find out what the real Turkey Leg was. You never no. wanted that. I mean, no the the uh, the very first year that I lived with Ron Martin, we started a uh, like a Thanksgiving studio party and we lived in a place that we called the hawk's nest which was his house over on hawk avenue in ellet and ronald deep fried a turkey and then baked a turkey like in the oven cooked a turkey regular you know tra traditionally traditional style and this was like your first year at akron like your, yeah, and, your and, first and, semester and, and thing because i i feel like i need to correct you why because as far as to my knowledge and i i might be wrong on this you might be right but there was the hawk's nest, but I really, I, I'm very confident for some reason mm -hmm. that my first percussion Thanksgiving was at the Brown Street house where Adam Wells lived out with Daphne Check, um, where then it was in line like to get turkey, don't know the rules on anything. I'm like, oh, there's still a turkey leg. So I grabbed the leg, so not you... knowing that the rules were the legs went to one leg went to whoever was hosting yeah. and one leg went to whoever was um, cooking. Mm -hmm. And I could have sworn it was Wells, but maybe it was Ron who then like stormed out and be like, who took the Turkey leg? And like, I look up and I'm like, it's like in my mouth. Yeah. You're I'm just like, like you're literally and, like and a then, Flintstones I, cartoon over there. Just like, <laughs> yeah. like nomin on the... And everyone was just like, you're a Turkey leg thief. I'm just like I didn't know the rules because I, I, I swear I swear to this day at that time my freshman year did not know the rules. <laughs> well, until and, until we everyone verify, called me a turkey leg thief and it just stayed as turkey leg. Until we verify whose house this happened in, I'm going to stick with my story, and I'm fine. <laughs> I'm okay with being wrong. If I'm wrong, if I we find out that I wasn't at this party, but I have this image. I'm in sure my you know you were there. Of, you were there. I have this image in my head of like. We had just met a month and a half prior, and you're like, hi, I'm Josh Tariff. And I'm like, hello, freshman Josh Tariff, blah, 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 get out of my face, whatever. And I went and practiced Merlin. <laughs> well, then fast forward a month and a half later, we're at my house, and you're still the freshman Tariff. We haven't really done anything that much as a studio yet. We're still only in November. Yeah. And you walk in my house with Ron Martin, and I'm like, hey, what's up? And you're like, hey, and you just walked right up and grabbed the biggest turkey leg. And I just remember standing there with Ron Martin and him looking at me and going, <laughs> just mouthing it as you walked away like what the fuck does he think he's doing like this kid is going to be either totally fine in life or he is going to be in for a world of fucking hurt because he just waltzed oh, in God. and took the turkey leg right out from under everybody's nose how anyway, did i survive i told you i think it was the i think you turned out to be the one kind of the, the version of the kid that was going to be totally fine you're either going to be a hot mess or and have your ass handed to you by somebody for stealing their turkey leg, or you are going to be okay. And it turned out you were okay. So um, anyway, I just wanted some people to have some context behind that that story um, for oh, man. just my own personal. Well, hey, listen, man. This has been really fun. Stephanie sends her love, by the way. Tell, um, tell her I send her love right back. She's never sa her. She said she's never felt safer than when she lived with you and Adam Wells. And um, What does that say about you? I don't know. That's what I said. <laughs> She's never felt more creeped out than when she lived with me, but never been Makes safer. Than when... Okay. Well, listen, man, you stay, where, where are you right now? Are you out in California? Yeah, I'm, I'm in LA. Um, you know, just, just outside of LA, um, you know, living that pandemic life. Uh, but you know, hope, hoping, you know, now, and now thankfully it's looking more so the sooner rather than later living going on that, I can start, you know, doing wrestling shows again, improv shows again. I've mm -hmm. uh, been doing stuff virtually in the meantime. Mm -hmm. yeah, but um, obviously, like I said, there's nothing like being in front of a live crowd. And people want to be parts of live crowds Yep. again. So it, it will it will happen soon enough. Well, man, good luck. Keep me posted and uh, stay safe and healthy, okay? Thank you. You too. It was good to see you, man. Good to chat. Good to see you, man. Good, good talk. All right. See you. Bye. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum. Liquiddrum.com down in Waco, Texas. Uh, my good friend Todd Meehan runs an amazing percussion company down there. Great merch, great content. Check them out. Liquiddrum.com. 
Also, Kyle Dunleavy, dunleavypans.com, D-U-N-L-E-A-V-Y pans.com. Kyle Dunleavy makes and builds all the steel drums that I perform and teach on uh, in so percussion as well as at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing tuner builder, um, just a really nice guy, very dependable. Check him out. If you are interested at all in steel pan advocacy, uh, want to learn more about the goings-on uh, in Pan in Brooklyn, check out paninmotion.com. My good friend Kendall Williams, uh, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, and uh, Arisha John run an amazing organization called paninmotion.com. Check them out. And finally, Aleandre Mirage runs an amazing uh, clothing apparel company in Brooklyn that is steel pan-centric. You can check him out at mangochowclothing.com. I own a bunch of his shirts. They're amazing, very stylish, uh, beautiful, beautifully made. Check them out. MangoChowClothing.com. Okay, hope you're well. Talk to you soon. Bye.